Hello, this is Chris from We Are Change Germany. I'm delighted to be joined by Michael Jaco, who is probably best known for his book The Intuitive Warrior. It's his first book and it mainly revolves around his experiences as a Navy SEAL and as a security contractor, where he discovered and developed psychic or intuitive abilities that helped him to stay alive and prevent attacks against him and his teams on his missions all over the world. While being deployed in all those war zones and also earlier and later on, Michael found out through his own efforts that there is more to life, more to all those wars, more to history and more to what is commonly considered reality, much more than what the powers that cease to be would like to confine us to. And so instead of just being a wheel in the machinery, he really transcended the situation and is truly pushing the envelope. Michael also started giving lectures and seminars that are both physical and spiritual, where he teaches people to also discover and hone the skills that he found in himself. And currently he's working on a couple of books about his past lifetimes. We'll go into all that and maybe even more. So hi, Michael, and thanks for being on with me. Well, it's great to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me. I got plenty of questions for you since you really covered a wide range of topics in your book, The Intuitive Warrior, which I didn't really expect from a person with your background. I mean, for someone who has been physically immersed in highly demanding military operations, over an extended period of time, alone 24 years as a SEAL, you really did present a broad and comprehensive understanding of a lot of the issues that are being frequently discussed in the alternative arena today. For a start, maybe you could just outline in your own words the path that you have taken in this lifetime. How did you become the person that I've just described? Would you agree with that description anyways? Oh yeah, that's a very good description, thank you. So, I think uh, being a Navy SEAL... It was something that I came upon when I was a, a small child, uh, probably about four or five years old. I was watching movies one one time, and I saw this movie about the uh, Navy Navy SEALs called Navy Frogman. And uh, I was always a fish in the water, so I was like, that's what I want to do when I grow up. So I, I think we have kind of a, a life plan when we incarnate, and that was uh, once once we find it, we really attach to it and really you know go at it with a vengeance, so to speak. So... Uh, as I was growing up, I got into lifeguarding, uh, anything that had to do with uh, being, being around the water. So I developed my skills uh, in the water. And then once I went in the Navy, I became a hard hat diver uh, and then went on to uh, SEAL training. The SEAL training, I think, is, is really the thing that opened me up to all of the, the beginnings of the intuitive abilities. I was able to see other people with uh, extremely advanced uh, abilities already. And it kind of started to open my eye to that possibility. I was uh, fortunate to be around a lot of Vietnam vets that had uh, had a lot of combat experience. And I think any anytime you're put into uh, life threatening situations, it really activates part of you that you know a survival type of part of you that really opens these uh, these channels. So these guys were uh, able to intuitively you know, things were going to happen. And uh, I outlined some of these in the books where one particular guy that was that I was really close to that had trained me quite a bit, he, he would have this ability to know, uh, like, when ambushes, training ambushes, were where and when they were set up. And we would go around these. And eventually, I would do the same thing. But on a, on a real scale, a combat scale, I, uh, at one time developed, uh, through, uh, the, it was a Tom Brown course. It's a survivalist course taught tracking and survival wilderness awareness. <clears throat> and his skills were from Apache elders. And, uh, I really got into those courses, went through a lot of those courses and that, uh, opened me up even more. So with the seal training, uh, you know, really pushing myself into other aspects like the uh, the ancient Indian way, so to speak, American Indian ways. It opened up uh, more pathway. I became a remote viewer, and at first started out I was I was I would just remote view the path in front of me, and then eventually I got to the point where I could, you know, do the road in front of me, and uh, it became a game. I would uh, try and see where the next, you know cop was on the road, on the road, so to speak, uh, with a, with a checkpoint, you know, trying to get speeders. And I, and I started getting it very accurately. And then eventually when I went into combat situations, I would remote view the road ahead of us, just like I'd done, you know, you know, as a, 
you know, in the States, so to speak. And I, I was able to see where ambushes were set up. And I would hold my team up and we wouldn't go down these roads or we'd, we'd wait until the ambushes sprung on somebody else, unfortunately. But uh, it, it, I became very adept at it. And then there was uh, one point where I had this out-of-body experience. And I talk about this in the book. And the book is kind of like a, a Pulp Fiction type book. It starts you off in, in a, where I have a situation where I am able to stop an attack through thought waves, through love thought waves. And then I go through the book and I have all these descriptions of how I developed, like we're talking about right now, all these skills and all this awareness abilities. And at the end of it, I talk about an Archangel Michael incident where I had an out-of-body experience and I saw Archangel Michael. And I, it was kind of like a timeline type thing. I was seeing myself as being dead. So I, had, I was basically, I had left my body. So I looked down, I saw my body destroyed in, in, a, in a rocket attack. So these rocket attacks had been already happening, but uh, you know they hadn't hit any compounds yet. So I was seeing a, a moment in time where I was going to be, I was going to die. And I had died. So I had this thought that all these skills that I'm talking about right now, I was really, you know, able to help people. I, I really felt, you know, I could do a lot more for people in uh, teaching these skills and in uh, developing these skills further. And that's when I had this 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 feeling that there was a there was a presence looking down on me. So I looked up and I saw Archangel Michael, and you know, it was not a dream. It was I was fully conscious, just like I am right now. I was not in my body anymore, but my consciousness was still very, very real, even more so. So I had this vision of Archangel Michael, and I looked into his eyes, and I had this transparent energy of love. It was just overwhelming, just not describable in, in terms that we can think of. And then, boom, I'm back in my body, and then I saw this flash of light, and there was a huge explosion, and I realized that I had been given a chance to continue on. So it was uh, after that point is when my skills really started to develop. Uh, I was able to actually visualize when attacks were coming, days in advance. And then I would hold my team up when I knew th that these attacks were coming. And one particular attack was, was a devastating attack. The first attack in Iraq where they actually used car bombs. And I saw this attack coming like days before, visually. I could see it visually, see the attack in the place and the time. So my team was actually supposed to go out this one particular gate right when this attack was supposed to happen. And I, I hemmed and hawed. I gave a, I gave a long brief. Uh, uh, we were, I was not in the Navy anymore. I was actually a, a contractor at this point. But I was uh, protecting Ambassador Bremer. And Ambassador Bremer had just gone home on like Christmas leave, so it was just me and the rest of the team. So I was in charge. So... We're supposed to go out this gate, so I had I had to come up with a plan. Of, you know, I couldn't just tell anybody at this point. It was not something I was really sharing with people. So I uh, I made up a uh, we have to do this brief. So as we're doing this brief before we go out to this range that we're going to, this attack happened, huge explosion, over 100 people killed, <clears throat> and it was right at the time we were supposed to be going through this gate. So I was like, wow, that vision that I had was real. So from that point on, when I started getting these visions. I would just kind of focus on them. I would focus on the time frame, the place, and I would get all this information. And it started to become more and more intense. I could see these just pretty much at first I had to just do with my teams. Or, you know, if it impacted me personally, then I would uh, you know, make sure I kept my teams out of danger or people that I was supposed to protect. And then it expanded to the point where I could I could see these things happening in cities. And uh, one of the, I think one of the questions you wanted to ask me was, um, there was a point where I went against uh, negativity or evil. Yeah, exactly. You said you tried to use force on the etheric realm when you found out who was masterminding the attacks in Iraq. Absolutely, yes. So uh, that's that's where I started to expand my skills. Uh, this this happened over a several month period. I was like, well, if I can remote view these events happening in time. What, how about if I remote view who's actually you know, masterminding these attacks? And so I 
I started to visualize who was doing it, and I got a, a visual picture of who it was. And then I try, and I, I had other people actually going against demons and stuff like that in the etheric realm. So I'm like, well, I'll try my hand at that and see if I can make a difference too. So I, uh, I, I started to, I saw this guy, and then I started to focus on him, and I tried to, you know, see if I could push energy uh, to him to, you know, negate his abilities. And this unbelievable demon, almost as intense as Michael was on the positive side, just came out of nowhere and just, I saw it on this etheric realm, and I was like, poof. I was back in my body. I was like, "Okay, that's not going to happen anymore. I'm not going to. I'm not going to play that game." Uh, so, I think that negativity. If we focus on negativity, this is something that I've learned over time. If we focus on negativity, we'll attract that negativity into our lives. So it's very important to focus on on positive aspects. That's not to the point where we don't understand that there's, uh, you know, maybe a negative aspect that could come into our lives, be aware, of course, you know, of everything that can happen. We have to plan, so so to speak. But to focus on these negative aspects will give them energy. And that's what happened when I started to focus on this particular guy. Uh, I believe his name was uh, Masawi or something like that. But eventually, it was my, one of my former teams that actually uh, took this guy out. And when they when they took him out, the picture of him matched the visual image that I had when I when I saw him. So it was was a real event. So I learned from that to start to focus on just the the positive aspects. And over the next couple of years uh, of seeing these uh, attacks started to come up, I started started to actually tell my teams. I would you know tell them, hey, I know that there's an attack you know, on this day, like a week out stay away from this area. And these attacks would happen my, and the guys, some of the guys sort of go, whoa, what is that? And I was like, yeah, that's, that's something I can do. And they, they would ask me in this one particular instance, uh, do you see any more attacks coming? I was like, yes. In another week, there's going to be an attack here. There's going to be uh, two uh, car bombs. I can see the one car bomb is going to be uh, two guys in a truck. Uh, the other car bomb I'm not sure of, and I think motorcycle involved. So everybody's like, okay. So we briefed the people that we were supposed to be protecting, and they tried to uh, to pass some information on. But you know, how, how do you explain? You know, oh, this guy, you know, has this ability, and he sees an attack coming. He did the best that we could, you know, to, to to stay away from this one area during this time frame. And sure enough, there was this in this one city that I was in. There was this tremendous attack. Uh, and the motorcycle that I saw on the videos that we got later was, uh, they actually showed a, a motorcycle going through this one gate just before this truck, the truck that I described to everyone with two people in it coming through this closed circuit TV before it did an explosion. So you saw motorcycle, the truck, and then a huge explosion and it was tremendous loss of life. And there were two explosions, just like I described. There were, there were two car bombs. And they happened at the same time. And you could hear them throughout this whole city when they went off. There were huge explosions. So this really got everybody interested in, you know, this, this ability I have. And it was like, okay, what's, do you see anything else? And uh, this was unusual because this, this, this particular uh, country and city had not had any attacks at all. Uh, this was Pakistan. So Pakistan started really getting hit hard during this time frame. In fact, it was getting hit harder than any other place in the world. There was more terrorist attacks in Pakistan during this time frame than even in Iraq. So it was, it was really um, starting to shift uh, as far as the, you know, the guys that were trying to overthrow Pakistan for whatever reason. So uh, my, my team was like, okay, when's the next one? So it's, I saw that it was actually going to be where we were living. So this really got everybody's attention. And uh, this, 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 the reason why I bring this up, this was a change in abilities that I had. So what, we, what happens to many of us in this intuitive abilities that all of us have, that all of us can develop, all of us can tap into, and many of us do it on a daily basis but we're not aware of it, is that we, if we desire something uh, on the intuitive level, we will develop it. It will come to us. 
we just have to be aware of it and be open to it. So I, uh, this attack was coming and I was, everybody was really concerned because there was no way we were going to be able to move all the people out. And uh, we actually approached the people that were supposed to be protecting us and we said, uh, we have very good information that we're going to be attacked. And they were like, well, we've beat up the, the, the level of security and we, don't, we, don't, we feel that it's you know, unjustified to do it anymore. So within an hour after they were briefed, uh, they got a phone call from uh, a former general that lived in the era, area. And he said that uh, some strange Afghanistan looking gentleman had knocked on his door and were asking where the Americans were living. So this kind of confirmed to them that, oh, yes, this, this is real. So they were actively looking for us, and they knew where we were, and they were coming for us. So they beat up the security a little bit more, but it wasn't enough because I still saw it coming. And uh, so this, this was the shit that happened. Uh, I, I was like, well, maybe I can influence this person that is coming to do this attack on the etheric realm in a positive way. Remember, I tried to do the negative thing, and it had been it had been come back at me, you know, tenfold. Uh, and that's what I think that anytime we do anything positive or negative, we're going to get a karmic effect. So you have to be careful what you think of and what your thoughts are. So I remember thinking, you know, how can I remote remotely influence this person? And I was like, I just started focused on him. I could see him coming in the car. I could see the the explosive they had in the back seat. 18 years old, 18 or 19 years old. And uh, I started to in, intuit his thoughts. Uh, his thoughts were, you know, I, I really don't want to do this because, you know, I've never, you know, had a, had a wife. You know, I always want to, you know, have a, lot, a wife and children. I want to experience that love. And that was my end. I was like, you can't experience. I started to send to him that you can't experience that love. So I started focusing on that love more and more and more. And then there was, a, there was a point where I knew it was within a few minutes of the tax was going to happen. And he, there was a shift in him. And he decided not to do the attack and he drove away. That attack never came. And that was a turning point for me in learning to actually do what Archangel Michael had done to me. He had projected love to me. And now I was using this love projected out to people that were coming in to do these negative attacks. So from that point on, I was like, well, if I can do that for one individual, perhaps I can do that for a whole city. So I expanded it. I expanded. I created what I call bubbles. And I, uh, I, I would visualize this bubble of love over the city. And at first I had done it over just the places where we lived. And it had been extremely effective because attacks would happen all around us, but they would never happen to us. Um, so it... I started expanding it to to uh, to the cities, and as I would come into these cities, they would not have attacks. When I would leave these cities, the attacks would happen again, and the attacks were happening in every other city around us. And it, so, whatever city that I would go in, from that point on, once I started to learn how to how to project this love energy, and it's not just me. I I think this energy is within all of us. Well, I know it is. This energy can can be used for positive and it can be used for negative. Uh, this force is throughout the universe, uh, the force of love. And uh, we can either focus on this love and, and create wonderful things in our life or we can not and have the negative side. So I started to uh, connect with other people in these cities that did not want attacks. And through, our force, for, through a force multiplier, so to speak, uh, affect these cities. And then over time, as I was told through uh, intuitive investigations, I actually contacted this guy named Kevin Ryerson that channels uh, intuitive uh, entities from the other side, so to speak. I was told that my abilities were reaching a point where I was, I was trans transferring this energy and changing the environment so that it would last. So at, at one point, I would come into a city and the tax would stop because I would project the thought of love. And then as I left, attacks would happen again within a short period of time because the effects would wear out, so to speak, wear off. And then eventually I, I started to get to the point where I could come in and it would completely change the environment so that new energies could come in, 
positive energies could come in and it would it would push the negative energies out so that they couldn't come in and affect it anymore. So that uh, so that started happening in uh, Pakistan. So Pakistan went from the number one terrorist attack world uh, country in the world to way down the list. And I, you know, it was because it was, you know, you, you get to a point where you're like, am I really doing this? And then you, you get to the point where I am doing this and I need to really focus on it. So I went through these levels where I doubted. And then I went through these levels where I was like, okay, I'm really affecting change. So I, I'm at this point now where I know that I can affect change and if I can connect with other people that want this change, then we can make a, a major difference in the world. And uh, that's kind of one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to relate in The Intuitive Warrior, to relate that we all have these abilities, that we can make change in our environments, that we can, we can stop the, all the bloodshed all over the world. No one really wants it except for a small few. <laughs> and they're the ones that seem to be, you know, pushing us into these wars. So. If we can create environments where these these negative thoughts can't come in, then we can stop the wars and uh, and have better lives. We can start focusing on things that will progress us as uh, as humanity to higher levels. And I think that's what everybody really wants at this point. Well, that's definitely not the average career of a Navy SEAL, although you have seen it in the SEAL teams first, that's what you said, like in others where they would have this ability to intuit some dangers or whatever, that's when you became aware of the fact that this is a reality, right? Right. So it's really like everyone has them and that seeing it in others inspired you to do it yourself. It's like only when you get pushed into a situation where you have to go beyond what you could do just to survive, to accomplish a task. And right. There can be a spontaneous uh, evolution, so to speak, that, that happened with me. But what I'm trying to relate in the book is that everyone can, can do this without, uh, sponta sponta without it having to spontaneously be pushed on them. You know, like it happened to me and to other people that were in the SEAL team, so to speak. That we all have this ability. We just all, if we just focus on wanting this ability in our lives, then it will come. And uh, I give out, uh, you know, several techniques and, uh, and the courses that I'll teach in the future will, uh, will definitely uh, teach people how to, how to tap into these abilities. Now, one, one of the things that, uh, that everyone can do right now is just the thought, a meditative thought of, you know, of love and sending that love out. Now, most, a lot of people already do this. Uh, you know, a lot of religions teach, uh, you know, prayer and prayer is the same thing. It's the same thing as, as sending out the thoughts of love. But if you know that you have power within yourself, that gives these abilities much greater uh, impact. I think there are a lot of people out there that uh, know that their power of prayer is very powerful, so to speak. And that they, whatever they pray on, and there's, there's many instances of prayer groups coming together and uh, focusing on healing and stuff like that, and they're effective. There's also... Uh, uh, documented evidence that uh, that meditative groups like the Maharishi Yoga groups have been able to uh, have a major impact on lessening violence, uh, terrorist attacks, so to speak, um, injuries, uh, accidents, so so forth in cities that they focus their <clears throat> their thought energy on. So this is documented evidence over tw over 20 years now of the Maharishi Yoga uh, effect, so to speak. So it's what, what, I, what I love to do is to mix in scientific with the spiritual, and that makes it a little bit more palatable for people. And uh, so if, if you're skeptical about this, which I was for a long time, then, you know, do the reading. You know, there's, there's many books out there. There's many, uh, ev there's so much evidence out there. Uh, it's, it's overwhelming. You, you can't really negate it unless you have a completely closed mind. Yeah, everyone has these kinds of experiences in a way, intuitive insights, people would sometimes just overlook it, but it's always there, we can always call on these higher abilities, on our higher selves, whatever, it's always there, ready to be called upon. I mean, we as humans have to rest regularly, but this part of ourselves that knows pretty much like everything, and that empowers us to do these things, that's always there. Absolutely, yes, and uh, there's there's the, the waking conscious mind, there's the, uh, the subconscious mind, which has a lot of information in it that we've, we've experienced over time, whether we're aware of it or not. And then there's a the superconscious mind, which, which goes deeper into 
the divine mind, so to speak. Our soul, our souls are connected with, with the divine energy, uh, divine thought. And a super conscious mind, you can actually tap into that. And I feel that over time, I'm starting to tap into the super conscious mind and bring in these energies, bring in these thoughts, sharing them with people. Uh, over time, I've shared them with uh, many of the people that I work with that have been open to them. Uh, there's almost pretty much everyone in my groups that I work with knows that I have these abilities. There's some that don't believe in my methods, but if I tell a group that there's attack coming, everyone listens. <laughs> so it's it, it it comes to the point where you can be on whatever level you want to be. You can uh, you can completely uh, not believe in this stuff, but know that it's there. And maybe at some point in your life, you can connect with it. I think there's some people that have already started to connect with it, and they're not aware of it. Like, for instance, I think everyone's experienced uh, the thought of a loved one, and then that loved one maybe called them, or were. And that's that's the greatest one I love to I love to bring up. Uh, just think of a time where you were thinking about your wife, your girlfriend, uh, your husband, and so forth, and then the phone rang, and it was them. So that's that's kind of that intuitive thing that we have that we don't recognize. Most of us don't recognize, but it's easily recognizable once you point it out. So you're like, oh yeah, well that's that's intuition. Yeah, that that's a thought that transfers instantaneously over time and space. Well, I've been thousands of miles away from my wife, and we do this all the time. We'll send thoughts to each other, and then we'll we'll next time we we talk, we're like, oh yeah. I, I had that thought too, or yeah, I was just thinking about that, or yeah, I thought about that, and it just so happened to be the time frames where we were thinking about it. So these these thoughts are they don't know uh, time or space, and they can instantaneously trans transfer to another mind. Uh, uh, they can influence environments. Uh, that's that's part of the intuition, and the more that we uh, start to connect with this, the more wonderful things open up and happen in our lives. I guess you'd have to expect that some guys in the SEAL teams would have problems with these kinds of things because it's not like the classical idea of a soldier. It's pretty progressive when you, as an elite soldier, say you want to meditate and project our love and all that stuff. That's not what people would expect. It's really progressive. But when you have success, then eventually it convinces people that there's something to it. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's that's one of the advantages I think that I have Uh, after having been a Navy SEAL, a lot of people respect you know, you know the, the Navy SEALs at this point. Uh, they know that we go through what we go through and uh, our abilities and so forth on an on a analytical, physical level. So, why? How is that? And I, I point a lot of this out in my book that we're we're pushing into different zones. We go far so far beyond the physical in our training that all of us recognize that there's something else. Or some other abilities we're tapping into. Anyone can tap into these, and they don't have to be pushed on a on an extreme physical level that we do. Um, but you know, I have experienced that's the way I experienced them. You can experience them through other methods, other other means. Uh, there's a lot more gentler means to <laughs> experience these. Uh, there's plenty of uh, ex uh, you know throughout recorded history we have uh, we have buddha we have jesus we have all these masters that came in that were you know connecting with these energies and uh, trying to teach these energies to others you were also teaching some of these intuitive skills within the seal teams like when you were teaching martial arts or nlp and that kind of stuff how did that work out oh that's 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 a very good question uh, the the nlp or the neuro linguistic programming Uh, neuro being the mind, linguistic being words, and programming being how how words program our minds. So um, as we were teaching the hand-to-hand -hand courses, I started the Navy SEALs first hand-to-hand -hand course. Uh, there had been a lot of SEALs over time that had come in and taught their their particular systems, you know, their martial arts. But there had never been a, a system that was taught to everyone, a, a, a system that was teachable and that everyone could share in. So I was fortunate to uh, to be exposed to some extremely um, high levels of physical uh, uh, martial arts. Very physical, very very intensive. Uh, there were times frames where I went through uh, month long courses, where <clears throat> it was 10 hours a day every day for for 30 days, and 
for a for us to uh, have a uh, a memory uh, to be ingrained or some kind of you know uh, something that we can remember over and over again, kind of like you know when you brush your teeth or you drive your car, you really don't think about it anymore. Uh, that takes about 21 days. So if you do something this every day for 21 days straight, you'll build uh, basically a neuro linguistic groove in your brain. So these these grooves, these these memories in our brains, will help us to you know do you know simple tasks like that. But how about on a on a very much higher level when doing uh, martial arts skills? I think a lot of martial artists have uh, experienced these these periods in their time where they're kind of like out of their bodies, and this is something I started to experience over time. Where and also as a seal, where the the intensive physical training was so intense that I was starting to almost astral project out of my body and start to look down and and view the events as as they went went on. And when you're in freezing cold water over a long period of time, this is this is uh. This is something that's uh, very beneficial. So you can just kind of like project out and you know deal with the uh, the cold or the extreme physical activity, so forth. So uh, I, I was I was starting to kind of you know tap into this this out the what we call that an alpha state. Uh, it's a brainwave activity uh, when we're very focused on something, uh, a math problem, uh, reading a book. We're pretty much in a in a beta. Uh, brainwave pattern, and as an alpha brainwave pattern, it's it's a more relaxed uh, brainwave, but it allows us to tap into that subconscious mind, so to speak. And so, it was what we would teach the guys was to uh, fight an alpha. That's what we tell them, and that would be a more relaxed state. If you became extremely focused on something uh, like a beta beta problem, uh, it gives you tunnel vision. Uh, your breathing starts to get very um, con- con- constricted, uh, so that's not very good to uh, have in a, in a multi-fight situation because we put put guys in multiple people attacking them at once with weapons and so forth. And if you're into uh, tunnel vision, so to speak, that's more you're trapped in the beta mind mind state. So we're trying to get them to go into the alpha brainwave patterns, and uh, and what I was starting to experience is. Uh, a combination of beta and alpha, which takes you into uh, uh, gamma gamma brainwave pattern, and this is something that uh, monks and these people that you know lay on beds of nails, uh, you know levitate, uh, you know sit in the snow and it doesn't affect them. All these are documented evidence. You know that people can do this. You know stick nails into themselves and not bleed. All all this stuff is you know totally documented scientifically. So they they found that. Uh, these monks were going into these gamma brainwave patterns, and this is a this is a, this is a pattern that's not normal to the to the brain. So you're actually pulling in something that's that's above and beyond. So we have uh, beta, alpha, theta, and delta states. All all of these brainwave patterns happen within our brains at any one time, but usually one or more of them are more active than the others. So like I said, if you're focused on a math problem, so to speak. You're in beta. If you're kind of like in a light meditation state, you're in alpha. If you're um, in a deep meditate, meditative state, maybe uh, delta and then or theta. And then when you're sleeping, you're you're deep into you know one of the delta or theta, theta states. So this is where the dreams come in and so forth, where you have uh, contact with the the superconscious. This is where the dreams come in that you know give. Uh, these these amazing insights. Uh, you have connection with angels, uh, with God. Uh, throughout the, throughout time, we have uh, you know stories of these masters that have connected you know during these time frames in their sleep. They go to these sacred places and they they connect with uh, angels that give them messages. You know, so these stories are, are throughout the Bibles and the Quran and, and so forth. So. Uh, uh, I was teaching guys how to do this in a waking state, you know, how to fight in a waking state with with these deeper um, brainwave patterns that bring in these these abilities. So if if you were in beta, then you would get overwhelmed very quickly, and it was very obvious. So if you could learn how to relax, you could breathe, you could go into wide angle vision. Wide angle vision actually activates the alpha brainwave patterns. 
um, and, and move. So you're, you're moving, breathing, and in this wagging of vision. Obviously, wagging of vision would allow you to see more that is what's coming at you. Instead of just focusing on one person, you can see all these multiple fighters coming at you at one time. So we, uh, we push guys into this, and we push them into it, like I, we talked about, for over 21 days. It would be a 30-day training course. So they had, you know, this this neuron neuron groove, you know, being input into their brains where they uh, they program their their minds to, you know, activate this alpha brainwave state at will. So I can I can go into this alpha brainwave state at will. It, it doesn't ha- I don't have to go into a long relaxation process. I can go into it instantly. So by instantly going into it. I can uh, I can create these abilities, these uh, um, looking remote viewing, so to speak, looking through the timelines, uh, and that led me to the past life recall that you and I are working on now. Yeah, I want to go into that, but first, uh, to finish on this martial arts issue, you were talking about how you would change your perception when you would go into different brainwave states. Those that so that you can act in a situation in a more effective way. But you also wrote about how you would act on an energetic level when you would teach people applied kinesiology. That's also part of it. Not only the mental state that you're in, but also that you're not only interacting on a physical level with whomever. Yeah, on the, uh, w- once you start to uh, activate these, these brainwave patterns, uh, the, the alpha and you know, the gamma brainwave patterns, just like the the monks can do, they can do these amazing abilities. And Bruce Lee was uh, was tapping into this. Uh, a lot of uh, Dan Asano, who uh, took over Bruce Lee's uh, uh, work, so to speak, uh, in the martial arts in the JKD, the Jeet Kune Do. He he teaches basically the physical level first. You have to learn the physical level, and then you get into the this this deeper brainwave activity that we're talking about now my thoughts were when I was teaching the hand-to-hand course was to start them in the beginning and it made an amazing difference and I think the problem with a, a lot of groups is it's not acceptable these deeper this deeper consciousness and until you get into the deeper physical aspects you don't you can't even comprehend the uh, a lot of the you know deeper mental stuff that you can do so Bruce Lee was doing some of the stuff like one inch punch, and with with the one inch punch, he was knocking people over. And on a deeper spiritual level, what he was doing with this punch was he was helping that person, you know, reconnect with their 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 spiritual side, knocking sense into knocking sense into him, so to speak. So. It wasn't the brutal beat someone to, you know, almost to death before they could get to that point. It was one punch. And that, that was that was brilliant. And there's there's other masters who can do it without the punch at all. And I feel like that's what my work is doing. So it's evolved to a higher level. So we can start people out at the basic level, so to speak, with understanding the brainwave patterns as they work with the, the physical. And as they can understand and reach these higher levels, then they can start to project that energy without actually physically doing it through the mind, through the thought. Like affecting physical reality with your thoughts, what you also described in your book, like when you influence the weather and call in rain somewhere where it hasn't rained for, you know, quite some time. Right. Absolutely. Um, we, we've all heard the stories of the, the Indian dance, you know, the Indians doing the war dance or whatever and, and calling in rain. Uh, the, these are things that I've been doing over time and I, I've actually taught people to do these. Uh, it's funny because some of the seals that I work, work with over the years, even in the contracting world, once I started, once I wrote the book, they wrote, they read my book and they're like, you know, I, I agree with everything you write in that book, except the thing about the weather. And I was like, really? Well, let's, let's try it out. So we're in, uh, this one, I was in this one country with these guys and there'd been a long period of no rain and there was no rain projected for quite some time. So I was like, let's work together and let's bring in some rain. Usually the way it works for me, it takes me about three days once I start to focus on it to bring in weather. And they're like, okay, let's do it. So we did it. We brought in some rain and they're like, kind of like, you know, what everyone goes through. They're like, 
ah, yeah, but did we really do that? And it's <laughs> like, okay, let's, and then we pull up, I'll pull up the weather. And I was like, okay, look, this was, this was not projected. It happened. There's no projection of any weather coming for the next three days. So let's do it again. So then we, we bring it in again and, uh, and they're, and then they're sold on it. You know, usually there's some hard, hardcore cases where people, you know, you can teach them over and over again. They're like, well, and I think we all go through this where we, we get some kind of, uh, something in our lives. We're like, if I could just get one sign and I've seen this happen to people <laughs> and myself included over time, if I could just get one sign and they get that sign and they're like, okay, if I could just get another sign, you know, and it just, it's just on and on. It's like, the, the monkey mind, the ego mind just is never satisfied. And that was one of the things that I, that I talked about in my book, overcoming the ego was one of the, the biggest things, the little death, the little death of the ego, which wants to control us, wants to keep control of our, our, you know, our minds, wants to control our world, so to speak. And this is one of the greatest, uh, challenges to humanity. to I believe to overcome this, this ego, uh, to be humble. Uh, you know, all the masters taught you have to be humble before I can teach you, so to speak. And, uh, and that's the same thing with, with any kind of intuitive work. If, if you're not humble, if your ego gets involved, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin what you're trying to do. So I did an uh, American Indian vision quest. And in this vision quest, you go four days without food. And I'd done, you know, maybe a day without food here and there. But, you know, four days, that was going to be quite a challenge for me. So I was like, okay, I'll do this. And uh, usually the vision quest is you come into the vision quest quest with questions, you know, things that are or problems in your life you want to overcome. Uh, the American Indians used to do them with uh, with their young, young, young adults as they come into maturity. They would they would do these vision quest and they would have a vision for their life. So I, I wanted this vision for my life. You know, I was at a, at a time in my life where I was uh, getting out of the military uh, I was wondering, you know, what I was going to do with my life once I got out. And I had kind of thought that I was going to do, you know, teach people and uh, interact with people and, and stuff like that. And I was like, is this, is this the right thing? So I did this vision quest. I've actually done several vision quests over, over the years. But this first vision quest was what the Amer American Indians call the little death. It's the death of the ego. And it's not like your ego actually dies or you kill your ego or anything like that. It just no longer has control over your life anymore. The higher self, so to speak, the 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 divinity within, the the soul manifest in your in your reality. All these things that the masters taught over the years has to, the only way that that can come through is through overcoming the ego in your life, controlling your life, so to speak. And uh, I think we've all experienced, you know, egoic periods in our life where you know we had to have our way, and you know. Uh, we, we've seen people like this. It's easier to see it in other people than it is in, in ourselves, but we, we can all, all think about people that are very egoic and that control and uh, do uh, negative things to other people. And uh, So I wanted to get that out of my life. I wanted that to stop controlling my life. Uh, these, uh, I would have these anger moments, so to speak, you know, where uh, they were, it was ruining my life. Uh, so I wanted to overcome this. So I, get, I, went into the, I went into the woods, basically. Uh, this was in the uh, Pine Barrens of New Jersey. Uh, there was a group that actually uh, teaches this. It's uh, uh, Earth Heart. And uh, very, very good group. So I, I went through them. Uh, it's a little bit of, little bit of uh, they start you off with uh, no solid foods. They start giving you for first day or so uh, before you actually go into your vision quest, you know, just soups and stuff like that. You know, start to eliminate stuff out of your body, uh, and then they they teach you what you're going to do and how to do it and what you can expect. So it, it was it was very good. So I get in before I even go into the woods, like just an hour before I go to the woods, all the answers that I had or that I wanted to have answers to just just came to me. Boom, 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 boom. I was like, oh. And then I got kind of like this this thought in my head. Now that we got that out of the way, now we're going to get to work. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. So the first day, you kind of you kind of go through, you just, you just crave food all day. So it's the ego. The ego wants to be fed, you know. So you're like, God, I wish I had. You think of all the foods that your favorite foods 
and just go through your mind over and over and over again. So this kind of egoic monkey mind just keeps going on and on and on. You know, it's, you don't really need to do this. You can, you can, you can get the answers yourself. You know, you already got the answers you want to get. You know, you don't need to be here. So all these thoughts go through your head, and you just quietly let them go through your head. You, know, you, you, you become the observer. You observe these thoughts going through, and you don't let them attach to you, so to speak. You just let them just pass through. And I've learned to do that with a lot of stuff, and it's it's really helped me over time. So uh, the second day, you start to start to get into it a little bit more, uh, and then the third day is when it really starts to hit you. Uh, all the things that had happened in my life that had been uh, negative, that I had caused to be negative, you know, the, the anger, angry moments, uh, you know, um, pushing people out of my life, uh, all these moments started to come up to me. And it was a, a very emotional, emotional time because these, these thoughts, these memories were extremely real. So I think that's what happens with, with the, uh, the vision quest, one of the, one of the beauties of the vision quest. Because uh, once you get past the egoic mind, then this, this emotional uh, baggage, so to speak, can come up and you can get rid of it. You can let it go. Go out of your life. So I, it, it's funny, uh, on the, uh, the third night, I had always had this, this dream to... Uh, to see a whippoorwill. A whippoorwill is a uh, bird that uh, gives, gives a call out in the woods. And I grew up in the south and you could hear this whippoorwill calling. And the calls are, are kind of a, it's a lonely call because they're searching for a mate. So they're calling out for a mate. And it's like a <laughs> type of sound. So you, you hear the sound and you hear it far, far off. And if you try to go to the sound, it gets further away. It's like they know you're coming and they don't want to be seen. So I, I have never heard of anyone that, that had seen a whippoorwill, and I wanted to see one. So here I'm in this vision quest, and I hear this whippoorwill, you know, calling out. It's kind of, you know, kind of a lonely sound. And uh, after having an emotional day, I was like, wow, you know, I can feel for this guy, <laughs> this whippoorwill right now. So I, I kind of like dozed off. It was deep in the deep at night, you know, the stars were out. I was under this this huge old pine tree that had died. And it's kind of like, it was kind of symbolic, you know, here I was dying a little death and I was under this, this huge old, you know, pine tree that was dead, but still was, you know, standing, uh, all the branches were bare. So this, I could hear this in my dream, I could hear this whippoorwill and I woke up and there was a whippoorwill on the branch right above me, looking down at me. And I was like, I'd been woken up and I was angry from being woke up and I like, shoot it away and then I and then I went back to sleep. I was kinda of like in and out of a sleep and then I was like in my in my half sleep I was like, You just saw a whippoorwill. Get wake up <laughs> So I woke back up and I looked and it was gone. So it was it was kind of uh kind of symbolic, you know, and on many levels. Here it was a dream of mine. I had just realized that dream and angrily I'd shoot it away. So it it was like, okay, all the anger that I, all the egoic anger that I'd had in my life, that it had ruined my life, here it was, it brought to me in symbolic form with this, this bird. So the next day I woke up and then I really became at peace with myself. I was like, you know, I'm, I'll never have an egoic response. And if I can help, if, if I notice this, this feeling coming up within me again, I will let it go. So from that point on, I think that was a really big turning point. For me, uh, the remote vision stuff really started to come in, and then I had the Archangel Michael experience. So, I would never have had those experiences if it hadn't been for overcoming this this egoic side, so to speak. There's so many great people out there who really want to help out, and there's surely something in everyone that I'm not particularly comfortable with. But I mean, there are even things within me that I'm not comfortable with. By getting along anyways and focusing on common denominators and how we can create something positive together, that's what it comes down to. That's what's necessary, really. Oh, absolutely. And I think that fear is another thing that, that, uh, that really holds us back as, as humanity. And there's, that's another thing I talk about to a, a great extent in the book. Um, fear is, is, a, is, is a constrictor. And when, we're teaching the, the, when I was teaching the martial arts, uh, you could see guys that went into fear and in fights, so they had to overcome that fear. And the way to overcome that fear was to let it pass through you, and then and then to focus on that alpha state, and that would bring you into you know that that 
more meditative, relaxed state. So the constricting of the fear, many of us have uh, the fears in our life. And I'm not talking about um, being uh, you know, aware of uh, negative things that could happen in our lives. That's, that's not what I'm, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about real fear that constricts us and keeps us from being, achieving you know, who we can really be. And what I, what I learned to focus on is if any time <clears throat> I had any instance where some type of fear were to come into me, where I would feel that constriction, so to speak, I would relax, let it, let it go through, kind of observe it, kind of like the same thing with my vision quest. I observe it, uh, let it go, and then focus on love. So notice the fear. Notice it for what it is. Let it go out of your life and then focus on the love. It's, it's, it's a very easy equation that anyone can focus on. It's not complex. It's a simple process. It's just that it's hard to do. I know, because we've been taught that, that they're not easy. So that, that's another thing. I mean, there are educational systems, our uh, you know, religions, uh, the government, so to speak. They want to keep us in fear because we're easily controlled that way. Uh, I believe that uh, if we learn to uh, think and love, so to speak, uh, in our lives without depending on other, other people to tell us what to think and, and love, then uh, we'll be much better off for it. Okay, I want to go into the reincarnation thing now. And there's a story I want to tell you. I was sitting at a bus stop in Germany with an old lady next to me and she saw that I was reading your book and she said, oh, that's nice that you're reading an English book. You know, I'm a retired English teacher and I just got myself a book about nothing to practice my skills a little bit. But I have to look up words every now and then. And it's nice to see that you're just reading your book right away. And I said, yeah, today with the internet and technology, we're growing up with English pretty much and it's not that hard to And she says, yeah, technology, that's really cool. What's possible with that? And I said, yeah, it's true. But actually, the real technology that is emerging, that, that is really making a change, is the technology of the mind. And then I was citing out of your book the thing with Masaru Emoto, for example, who was affecting water crystals. And I said, that's the thing, how we affect physical reality with our mind and what potentials we have there. And she was making big eyes and saying oh that's strange that you mentioned that because I've been doing this all my life but I never told anyone never anyone in my family or for my friends oh my god that's amazing and I know that it works you know because I've been praying for everyone who was leaving my house always so that they would have a safe journey and only one time when I didn't do it that person died on that day and that person was my husband and I was thinking whoa what have I gotten into here And I thought there must be more to the story with her husband. But anyways, what am I going to say now? And I uh, switched the conversation to saying that I have had past life memories and that I'm doing past life regressions and all the things surrounding that and that I think life goes on and, and so on. And her eyes were getting bright again. And she was saying, oh, and you know what? When I go to flea markets then and I see rain clouds, then I just send my intentions up to disperse them. And it really works. And then her bus was coming and she had to leave and the, she had this sense of positive expectation in her eyes, this confidence that she would see her husband again. And you know, she was just, from the looks, a normal old lady and she said she never told anyone and from her friends or in her family. And I think there are a lot of people out there actually who have experienced extraordinary things, but who are maybe afraid to share it. Yeah, that's that's a very good point, and that's uh, that's a beautiful story. Uh, that's that's kind of a synchronistic event too, when uh, when we're, there's something in our lives that we're focusing on, and we have questions about it, whether it's right or whether we should be really focused on it, and then something like that happens, where it's just a, a magical moment. You know, you're on the right track. It's kind of like these signposts that we have throughout our lives. You know, to uh, if we get off track, something will get us back on track. If we're open to these uh, these little synchronistic events, so to speak, but yeah, the uh, the past life information has been has taken me to a much different level. Uh, all these abilities that I have uh, that I have been experiencing uh, once I started the the past life recall and doing the imp and doing the research on it, I was seeing that I had a pattern of uh, having these lifetimes where I was making uh, amazing things happen. Uh, kings and emperors and uh, all these different things. Uh, at first I was like, 
you know, maybe maybe I had uh, a lifetime with these, you know, people. You know, I just uh, I, there's no way I could be uh, Constantine the Great. That's that's ridiculous, you know. Uh, who am I to have been, you know, somebody great like that? Uh, it took me uh, an extremely long time to get to the point where I could uh, I could see that. And uh, once I started to see that, then things really started to open up for me. But it's kind of it's kind of been a long process. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I became interested, and I would say probably within the, the six or seven year old uh, fr uh, age frame uh, in, in reincarnation. And that was because of my hero at the time, Patton, uh, the tank commander, World War II tank commander, had, uh, had talked about that in a movie that I saw and uh, uh, how he'd had a reincarnation. As, uh, as I found out later, he, had, he described this battle, which Hannibal had been in, and I found out later that Patton had actually been Hannibal and I'd been his, uh, uh, with him. Uh, I'd been, had many lifetimes with, with Hannibal. He was uh, with Alexander the Great, who I was with as well. So um, I think we come in in uh, these lives and we experience uh, people that have been in our, our lives and before, you know, in past lives. The, like the loves in our lives uh, very, very often have been uh, loves in our lives and past lives. Like my wife, for example, we've been uh, husband and wife in countless lives. It's just, it's just amazing, and and you kind of, you kind of know it when you look at someone and you just kind of get that that overwhelming attraction. I think that's 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 a very good indicator that yes, you've experienced you know lives with this person before. I would say that you know you and I have uh, had had have had lifetimes together. I haven't researched that yet. Uh, when the moment's right, I think the next time I talk to uh, Atun Ray, then it'll be interesting to find out, you know, what we have uh, experienced together. Um, uh, so it's the, these these past lifetimes, like I said, uh, were able to uh, help me connect with these these strange things that were happening in my life. You know, these strange abilities. Uh, and once once I realized that, you know, I was a priest, so to speak, with you know, these great masters. Uh, one of the first readings that I had, I was with, uh, I learned that I was with uh, Jesus. And uh, I was like, I was with Jesus. <laughs> it took me years to, uh, to, to take that on, to, to, you know, to understand that that was, that was even a possibility because, you know, who, who am I, you know, to have been with Jesus. And then I found out that I was with not only Jesus, but with Buddha. And uh, it had, uh, a, a, maze, a major uh, lifetime with Buddha. I was with him for 25 years uh, as his personal assistant. I was his cousin, and then uh, he, he personally wanted me to be his personal assistant. So uh, I, I remember having all these uh, thoughts about Buddha. I thought, that even though I was, you know, Christian at the time, I was like, well, Buddha, you know, he's got some good things too, <laughs> you know. I just didn't want to focus on just one one religion, and I haven't throughout my life. In fact, now I, don't, I really don't feel that I I'm attached to any religion. There's there's so much uh, information out there from all these different masters that I like to just read about. You know what they had to say, because it seems like a lot of the re religions these days are are kind of controlling. They want to focus you into one aspect and make you beholden only them. I mean that's happened throughout lifetime. We we we've seen that. Uh, if, if you're a Muslim today, if you try to leave the Muslim religion, then basically you're going to die. They put out a death warrant on you. So it's that's happened. I think through you know, many religions over time. Christianity was that way at one time as well. So uh, ha have they evolved? Uh, maybe a little bit, but their ultimate goal should have been to help us find a deeper reality within ourselves that we can connect with. That we don't have to go through a priest or someone else that has to do, can do this, that does that for us. They should be our guides to do that on our own. How does you in this lifetime turn the corner that you really came to the conclusion that past lives are existent, that you lived before? How did you start with exploring your memories? Uh, I, I kept having these <clears throat> synchronistic events, like I, I was, like we just talked about, where um, I had this huge attraction to go to the Battle of Gettysburg the battlefield site and uh, I had had it for years so I finally got the opportunity to go there and when I was there I had one of these sort of out-of-body experiences which which used to freak me out but now 
you know, I, now that I can control them and I know what they're about, they're, they're trying to bring great amounts of information into you at one time, a big, you know, information dump, so to speak. So I had this out of body experience and I could, I visualize myself over the battlefield at this one particular spot. It's called the, uh, the angle and it's where, uh, Lewis Armistead had, uh, and had reached the highest, uh, level. And I didn't find out too much, many, many, many years later, that I was actually the, the general Lewis Armistead, uh, on the Confederate army side that had reached that point and had been wounded. So I had, I had this vision out about experience right there while I'm in a waking state of, of having these wounds and falling on the battlefield of that spot. And I was like, wow, that is really weird. So it wasn't, it wasn't until maybe another seven or eight years later that I really started to explore, uh, you know, go to a psychic, so to speak, because they have deeper insights than, you know, most of us have. And I got the, the reading where I had, I had been, you know, Lewis, while I had been at the Battle of Gettysburg. So one of the beauty thing, beautiful things about, you know, the guy that I'm working with now is he'll give me little tidbits of information. You know, yes, you're at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, contact this one particular person and he can help you. So I contacted this one guy who had had a, he had written a, a book about, uh, you know, his, his reincarnation. He, he was his incarnation during that time frame as well. Uh, he was a, a general during that time frame. So I contacted this guy. And so he started to help me, you know, walk me through. He says, you know, look at what, what do you think, what do you think you were? And I was like, well, I have a visual of, of having a sword and, and, and boot riding boots. And he said, well, that sounds like you were uh, a general officer. So look at the general officers, you know, from that time frame. And so I started looking at them and I, I really couldn't see it at first. And my wife, uh, I, was was kind of involved in it, and uh, I had been to Pakistan. I'd been to Afghanistan, and I had grown out a beard, kind of trying to blend in. You know, you you don't want to stand out too much in some of these places where they they don't like you know um, foreigners. So I had grown a beard, and uh, my wife got a picture of that beard because most almost all of the uh, the Confederate officers in that time frame there there and uh, all officers in general, you know, uh, whether they're Union or Confederate, they had beards. So I was like, okay, well, let me, let me look at uh, my, my bearded picture, and, and I still couldn't see it. So my wife started looking, and she said, who are you looking at? And I was like, well, this guy kind of looks familiar, and, and she's like, takes my picture and puts it right beside Louis Armistead, and it's almost like a match. I was like, oh, my God, because that's one of the things that you carry through almost all of your lives. There's it's a general uh, outline of your face, and... Uh, and, I've seen, and that's one of, the, one of the things that I use when I look at uh, past lives, when I have an attraction to a certain period or a certain person, uh, I'll start to look at the pictures and see if anything kind of jogs my memory if someone looks kind of like me. And some of them have been pretty, pretty amazing, you know, the, the, the visual uh, uh, resemblance, facial features and so forth. Another thing that, I, that, I, that really got me uh, interested in, in past lives was... Um, uh, Shirley MacLaine, she did this one particular uh, series uh, where she had gone into uh, past lives, and it's called Out on the Limb. And she's written so many books on uh, on past life stuff, you know. And she's basically sharing her experiences too, which is something that that I intend to do in, in my future books uh, of her past life experiences. And uh, that really opened the door for me as well. So between you know all these you know people. That uh, that I looked up to, uh, whether they were, you know, uh, Henry Ford, you know, had he said, yeah, we're obviously reincarnated. There's no way that I could have all these, you know, this knowledge if I hadn't had many past lives. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I, I was very much into uh, the Buddhist uh, traditions. Even Christianity at some point has uh, has past life stuff. I think a lot of it's been taken out. But uh I think in the beginning, the scenes, especially which where Jesus uh, descended from, the scenes, he, uh, they, they, they had a very close uh, uh, relationship with the uh, past life information. So all these things started to coalesce, so to speak, to bring me to the point where, yes, obviously we've we've had past lives. 
uh, the abilities that I'm starting to connect with have have to have some kind of foundation. Uh, and, the, and the way I, de- I describe it to a lot of people is think about um, when you were a little kid. You, you can, you know, okay, you get that picture of yourself as a little kid. You know, the memories aren't so clear. Uh, maybe there's some, some point of when you're a little kid that, that really stands out. You can focus on that. If you focus on that, you start to remember, you know, more and more about that, that particular memory. Uh, you can remember, you know, who was with you and, you know, what you did, what you wore, maybe, maybe even what you ate. Uh, if you asked me what I ate, you know, three days ago, I couldn't tell you, but, uh, some of these, <laughs> you know, some of these past lives, I can just, I can just whip out some information on them. It's pretty, pretty impressive. But, um, uh, I, I just really started to, to, you know, focus on that. And when I, when I tell people, yeah, just focus on, you know, some aspect of when you're a little kid and think about, you know, going further back, going into another life. Uh, and, and start to bring information from that other life, just like you would information from, you know, when you were a little kid. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty similar. Once you start connect with this, uh, this past life information, it's just, um, it just comes to you. Uh, another thing that I, that I learned and it took me a long time to understand and to wrap my head around, so to speak, was that, uh, the linear time frame that we're kind of conditioned into believing is is the reality is just a very limited uh, reality. That a, a bigger reality uh, is that all time is is happening at once, and that just took me so long to get my my mind around. But that is something that I've come to understand. And so when I go into these past lives to to dig for information, I'm digging into something that's happening right now and it's it's really really hard to understand that but as i've as i've started to get into these past lives it's like i understand that that life when i when i these lives want to come through and talk these lifetimes want to want to tell me something that will help humanity and so they're coming through and they're talking to me so these stories that that are coming out in these future books are basically things that can uh, open up humanity so I once once I realized that yes, these past lives are, are real. I wanted to have my own past life reading because that seemed seemed to me to be how most people really connected with these past lives. So I went to this woman, uh, Mary Roach, uh, um, in Virginia Beach, and she was recommended to me by uh, the Edgar Casey Institute. And Edgar Casey was a uh, psychic uh, from the 30s and 40s who uh, talked to. Basically, gave a lot of readings, and a lot of his readings were on past life information and healing and so forth. So I was working at his institute in Virginia Beach, and uh, uh, working uh, on past life information. So, it was, <laughs> so it was, it was perfect. So that I was talking to this one woman that was working there. She's like, "Oh yeah, you should see Mary Roach. She's really hard to see. You know, a lot of people are trying to trying to see her, but she's uh, she's talked to a lot of us, and a lot of us are." are had been, you know, scenes or had worked with Jesus. I bet you have. And I was like, yeah, me, yeah, me. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> you know? So uh, it just, it was a synchronistic event. Mary Roach was booked up for three months and I called her. Uh, she said, no, there's, there's nothing, nothing available for the next three months, which was unfortunate because I was getting ready to move out of the area. And so it would probably be much longer. So she called me back within a couple of days. Said I just have an opening. If you can come tomorrow, I can see you. I was like, "Ah, oh, that's great," because I was leaving the next day. So uh, I went and saw her, and she just started rattling off all these these past lives that I'd had. She didn't give me actual um, names, or you know, she gave me kind of like a a general outline of of what I did in a lot of these past lives. So it it opened the, opened the door for me for these uh, for these lifetimes. And after that, I did. Pretty quickly, I did another uh, past life uh, um, reading from another woman because I, I wanted to kind of triangulate, so to speak. I was like, if this woman who knows nothing about me, doesn't even know Mary Roach, can tell me the same thing, then maybe this stuff is real. So sure enough, she told me pretty much the same thing. And I didn't I didn't query her. I didn't uh, try and steer her anyway. She just came out with pretty much the same uh, general information that Mary Roach did. So several years pass by. I'm I'm doing starting to do the research. I'm starting starting to feel kind of like you know where I had been uh, in, in a lot of these past lives. A lot of Egyptian lives, um, 
a lot of Roman lives, a lot of Greek lives. Uh, I've been all over the map. Uh, it, it's just amazing. And I think that if all of us could understand that we have been, you know, you know, had lifetimes and maybe as, as a Jew, as a Muslim, as a Christian, as religions that no longer exist, that maybe we wouldn't be so, uh, so hard pressed to, you know, ridicule or persecute or even kill someone of another religion just because they're not of our religion. Uh, to me, that is the most ridiculous thing in the world. So, um, but it goes on quite a bit, unfortunately. Uh, other things would be, uh, you know, we don't like a certain race. Uh, I've been every race there is known to man. I've been a black man. I've been a red man. I've been a yellow man. I've been every race there is known to man. And I've had significant lifetimes in each one of these, uh, each one of these races. So another thing, if we had, you know, racial prejudices, uh, we would probably get over them really quick if we realized that, you know, we had been the, you know, particular, or maybe we're going to be <laughs> because we're uh, ridiculing this particular race. So you get to, you get to feel, you know, what it's like to uh, be ridiculed. So, uh, you know, we, in one life, we might be the father and in another life we might be uh, the son or, you know, maybe even change genders. Uh, it's, it just goes, it just goes on and on. Uh, so, this persecution of another group because of uh, they're not like us would would end for a lot of people if they realized that you know they had been these these particular you know groups that they're ridiculing. I find it interesting that you say that you advise people to just connect with their past life memories, like with their childhood memories. Like people might say, that cannot be real. That's too simple. That's just imagination or whatever. But it's the same procedure that other experts and other fields also recommend, like Ingo Swann in Remote Viewing in his book The Sixth Sense, he basically says, just focus on it, be persistent and you will see results. Or that Casey said about telepathy or in manuals on how to induce lucid dreams or out-of-body experiences. It's really that simple. And when I was 15 I was meditating and I was also reading Buddhist books And I was wondering during meditation if reincarnation is real, what could I have been in a past life? And I was immediately having a vision where I was like in a foreign country and I was helping people to make something out of their lives. And then some people from the ruling class were approaching me and they were not happy with what I was doing. And so they took me away and imprisoned me somewhere. I had the feeling and then I didn't want to see what was going on there. I stopped it. But I was thinking that I just made it up, you know, it was just fantasy or whatever. And I even had dreams later about like the same scenario and how it went on and was, you know, horrifying. But um, I thought it was just made up or whatever. I really didn't grasp the significance of it. And it was only two years ago that I was in contact with a psychic and I was asking her if she could give me any tips how to help people. And she was giving me some and she said, you have also unfinished business from your last life where you were an emissary and you were helping people to, you know, grow within themselves and make something out of their lives. And then there were those people from there that didn't want you to do that and they imprisoned you and they tried to get information out of you, but you didn't even really know what to tell them and eventually they burned you. And when I got that information, I had the shills like all over and was laughing and crying at the same time, really. And the point is, it was really that simple. From then on, I really believed in what I had seen. In a way, it's so easy to connect with those memories, just getting in a meditative state and allowing the information to pour in. Now, when I regress other people, this is at the core for the session to be successful, that the people can put their analytic mind aside for a little while just let go and focus on what's coming in without judging it and then results can manifest so easily oh yeah there's uh there's so many books out there uh about past lives that they give you uh really good uh meditation uh sylvia brown's done a lot of uh she's a she's a great psychic that's done uh, a lot of books on uh you know uh past lives and uh even connecting with the the other side so one of the things that we do when we uh, when we leave our incarnation is we'll go to the other side, so to speak, which is a higher dimensional realm, 
And from there, we'll actually review our past, our life, and we'll see how our lives have impacted other people, whether positive or good. And we'll learn from that. And then eventually we'll perhaps uh, decide to come back into uh, another life. And we'll have, you know, soul groups and so forth that we've worked with for, you know, many, many lifetimes. And we'll make plans with them on what we want to, uh, what we want to work, work on. And uh, what, what, one of the things that, that I learned that uh, um, meditate, when they, when they put you into hypnosis, uh, I've done several hypnosis uh, sessions, past life regression hypnosis sessions. And uh, the, re the thing that really got me interested in these was uh, a lot of these uh, authors, a lot of these uh, psychoanalysts, uh, uh, psychologists, so to speak, had, uh, had done these, uh, basically taking someone which they thought they were taking them to their, their lifetime uh, to a point where they had a problem. So if someone so to speak, you know, had these uh, horrible dreams and they, they kept thinking that someone was going to hang them. They had this tightness around their throat, so to speak, and they couldn't understand it. So they're, they're going to this uh, psychoanalyst. And so these psychoanalysts were regressing them back, back to a point in their current life, they thought, where they had uh, a problem. Maybe, you know, their brother or sister, you know, was choking them. Or they were, they were very... Um, had a lot of anxiety about certain things, or sort of trying to take them back to something in their life so they could uh, work through it. So a lot of times, when you go to that point where you've had this problem, you can release it. So, lo and behold, a lot of these people were finding these psychoanalysts were were actually taking pe they were recalling past lives, uh, and this like for instance, this one person you know had this tightness around the throat. She was she was hung in a past life, and once she had connected with that, it was it was gone at that point. It's like, oh, I was hung on in, in life. Okay, well, that's that's stupid to be you know concerned about it in this life. So it was gone. So no more anxiety, no more tightness in the neck. So that's that's one of the beauties of uh, connecting with these these past lives. We can release you know trauma from these past lives, and I've released a lot of trauma uh, from past lives that was carrying over into this life. Uh, one in particular was uh, like I've already talked about, Lewis Armistead. Lewis Armistead's wounds were, I had, uh, I had my kneecap shattered. He had been shot in the knee. Uh, I had a problem with my shoulder. He had been shot in the shoulder. I had a problem with my arm, and I, he had been shot in the arm. So these three wounds had actually come through in this life. So once I connected with that, it, miraculously, these, these problem areas that I was having went away. Uh, I haven't had a, had a return since then. So when I had, when I personally had these uh, these past life regressions from a person that was actually trained to do these, um, I was connecting in these lifetimes, and some of the trauma, uh, some of the, and it's not necessarily a physical trauma. It can be emotional trauma. It can be you know mental trauma, so to speak. Uh, once I connected with them, and I remember uh, my first couple of past life regressions, I, I bawling like a baby, you know, you know, the emotions were just coming up and, uh, and you know, once, once I had this emotional release or these mental releases, so to speak, uh, it, it released me and, and opened me up to, uh, to a, a greater life, so to speak, you know, problems that I had in certain areas were gone. So that's another beautiful thing about connecting with, uh, with past life information is that we can, we can release traumas in our life and, even greater still, because there's a lot of great things about connecting with past lives. We can connect with these these past lives where we did amazing things, and we can bring that knowledge into this life. And that's one of the things that I've been doing uh, as well. Uh, the the remote viewing. The uh, the I've been able to help heal people. I've been able to you know I've had past lifetimes where I was a healer, uh, and, and I didn't actually start doing these until I'd connected with these past lives, knowing that I had these abilities and I wanted these abilities and I wanted to bring them forward again. So that's another one of the amazing things about these, these past lives. To, to think that we just come into this, this world and we live these, uh, these, this, this one life is, is, is sad, I think, <laughs> because there's so much more to it. And if we can connect with this, it can just open us up to so much greater possibilities. Yeah, of course, we focus on keeping our bodies healthy, but when the soul and the body grow together, then it's logical that when you really want to get healthy, you have to go beyond what happened to you in this lifetime. 
like you said, with the injuries that you had were, that were related to another lifetime. Oh, yes, definitely. What do you think? How can it happen that there are 7 billion people on Earth right now? Where did all these souls come from? That's a standard question that people who ask about reincarnation would be curious about. Even if everybody would reincarnate again, why are there multiple times the number of people that have been there in the past? Well, that's 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 a very good question. There's uh, something that I've found out is that we'll actually have multiple lives. We'll we'll live multiple lives. Like there's there's a small percentage of us that uh, incarnate, and so I think it's like uh, anywhere from four to seven percent will have multiple lives at any one time. And uh, I talk about this in my book as well, this upcoming book. Uh, that's that's one answer for that. So so you know, so to speak, we're It's multitasking on a on a on a grand level. Uh, we can we can write, you know, listen to the TV, uh, uh, you know, talk on a phone all at the same time. So that's kind of like multi multitasking. We can do the same thing as souls. We can split our soul energy and actually incarnate and and handle multiple tasks. So if there's, let's say, we wanted to accomplish something, I'll give you an example, a great example. I was uh, during the uh, Grecian times. Uh, ancient Grecian times, I was uh, I had uh, multiple lifetimes. I was a Spartan and I was an Athenian general, and uh, which 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 had a major impact. The Persian invasions, uh, the Persians were stopped at the 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 naval battle of Salamis, and that was uh, from a, a general named Themistocles. Themistocles, I was Themistocles in that lifetime. Themistocles basically uh, had. Uh, had a brilliant plan uh, that came into fruition years before that to uh, you know build more ships and and uh, stop the Persians when they came through. Uh, on another side, I was with uh, King um, Leonidas as uh, as a general Pausanias. Uh, Pausanias. So this is a same same time frames. Pausanias would be the one that would uh, defeat the Persian army at the at the at the last battle. So. So making sure that all and, and and why did they do this? Well, before these lifetimes, we 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 can look at the Greek as being the flowering of Western civilization, Western thought as we know it today. So I'd had um, lifetimes as uh, uh, philosophers. So uh, this flowering of, of thought and knowledge, uh, if the Persians had come through, would have crushed that because they're they were in a in a negative place and so by being in these particular lifetimes I was able to help stop that of course there were many people that were involved in those battles but uh, being a, being a, in the general being a general in one and an admiral in another and stopping stopping them was was very important so you know we can we can come in and we can incarnate in multiple bodies at the same time frame so that's one of the things I think that um, another thing is that uh, what's happening right now is Uh, we don't real. A lot of us don't realize that there are souls throughout many galaxies. It's not just souls on our planet. There's many, many, many planets out there, and sometimes we incarnate on some of these other planets, uh, you know, these other si solar systems, so to speak. Uh, maybe some of us are incarnate in some of those solar systems uh, and this one at the same time. Uh, but as as souls progress they go to different levels and if there's a level on another planet that someone can't particularly go along for the ride so to speak they'll go to another solar system until they've matured their soul to a certain point where they can you know join the next level so to speak so I think we incarnate and we reach a, 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 a very deep level so to speak we go deeper into in the incarnation realm Uh, very uh, negative, so to speak, and then we start to come back up to a positive level. So we're starting to see that at this point in our Earth, where the uh, there's a, a massive change. We, we've had a, a lot of people talking about um, uh, this, these energies that are coming in that are going to transform us, and I believe that is correct. I believe that we are, as humanity, we're we're transforming at a rapid rate. It might not seem very obvious right now, but Uh, it is, is happening. I see it on many different levels. Stuff that we could, this stuff that we're talking about right now, this would not have been allowed, you know, a hundred years ago. You know, we would have been killed. 
you know. So I think that uh, I think that a lot of information uh, is is starting to come come forward at a highly highly rapid rate. Uh, the internet is is helping that tremendously, obviously. And uh, at some point, we're going to be uh, telepathic. We won't we won't need to have funds, so to speak. So I, I think that we're progressing at a very rapid rate. So a lot of souls are coming in. They wanted to uh, come along for the ride. Uh, this is a, a momentous uh, moment in history throughout the universe, so to speak. And uh, a lot of souls are incarn- had incarnated to, uh, you know, help and to to be here for this momentous uh, occasion. Yeah, that's what I think too. But anyways, when you say that you can have several different lifetimes simultaneously, that begs the question of who you really are, who's in charge of all the different aspects, where is that consciousness residing? Yeah, we, we we tend to think that we are who we are in this this mo- at this moment, but we're something far greater. And uh, once you start to get your wrap your arms around that, then you start to understand that yeah, there's the past lives are, are a possibility, uh, multiple lifetime possibilities, uh, lifetimes in other uh, solar systems. Uh, maybe uh, there, I I don't think it's a maybe. I, I you know in our form, but definitely like we are. We're star seeds. So there's a. Uh, uh, the alien is kind of kind of species. We're all aliens. We're species from other from other planets, from our solar system. Yeah, I mean, like that I know of. <laughs> uh, sometimes I kind of wonder. You know, some people either if they're not uh, some kind of uh, from from a different place somewhere. Uh, uh, no, only known of anyone or had any experiences of uh, extraterrestrial, so to speak, uh, activity. Of, of course, the information is out there. I mean, it's it's overwhelming. It's it's extremely convincing. Uh, to to close your mind to it would be uh, a disservice to you know yourself and humanity, really. But uh, yeah, it's it's there's definitely uh, a lot enough people out there that have experienced it. I'm sure if you really really wanted to experience it, you probably would. I mean, I had a dream the other night where I had a spacecraft that was outside my window that was beaming information to me. So I don't know, maybe. <laughs> But that was that was like in the dream world. So, but uh, you you reach a point where sometimes you you wonder which which is the dream is is it this are we in the dream right now in this reality or is that more of a reality in the dream world? So. The false flag attacks, like you're talking about, you know, 9/11 was a was a false flag attack, uh, that and that you know that was the impetus to uh, get us into these wars. Uh, Britain had their subway uh, false flag attack. Uh, we just recently had here in the U.S. we had a false flag attack, so to speak, which was at the um, uh, the school, uh, the Sandy Hook uh, school event. A lot of my friends uh, still believe that 9/11 was was a terrorist attack. I mean, I, I look at 9/11 and I'm like, duh. I mean, look at the information. It's just it just it's so blatantly obvious that it was uh, some kind of inside job. It's to uh, keep a lot of people in power that uh, and, and and basically keep us enslaved. You know, uh, so as long as we let them get away with that, they will continue to do it. It's a hard line for a lot of people right now. Like like we've been talking about, you want to focus on the uh, the positive, but you can't focus on the po- positive to the exclusion of the negative. You have to understand that the negative is still trying to exert itself. And if you think that just by focusing on the positive will nullify the negative, that's that's not re- our reality right now. 
I, I, I kind of go back to uh, Teddy Roosevelt who said, speak softly and carry a big stick, you know. And we're being led down that road. We're being given all this this overwhelming false information that if here in the U.S., if we take away the guns, and pretty much everywhere in the world, I think, if the guns are taken away, then we'll be a lot safer. And we can look back through history and, you know, the Stalins, the Hitlers, the, you know, the, you know, we could go on and on. All these different, you know, leaders that took away guns basically took over control of their people in an extremely negative way. A lot of us are, are starting to realize that, you know, we're, we're, we're done with this kind of, uh, we're, we're done with this game. We're, we, don't, we don't experience, you know, this war and hate and fear and so, so forth anymore. We want to experience the, uh, the higher aspects of, of love and, uh, you know, finding, finding out, you know, more about who we are and, uh, you know, being creative, uh, having these, these wonderful experiences with others instead of, you know, going to another country and killing them. It's crazy. Um, so I, I, I really strongly feel that that's, that's the way we're headed. So as, as the consciousness rises, this, this ability to manipulate us in, into fear, into, into these wars, uh, so that these you know, elite, so to speak, can uh, stay in power and uh, control us, is going to dissipate. And it's, it's dissipating at a rapid rate already, I believe. We're ready to do this. We don't, we don't want this old, this old information anymore. We want to move out of it. We want to move ahead. So I, I see it on many different levels. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, fabulous time to be alive, uh, to see people starting to connect with this. Uh, they have the conversations that we're having right now. This is, this is, this is a brilliant conversation. I hope it connects with a lot of people. But um, unless people are ready to listen to it, I might, they might not get through the first uh, few minutes. You know, it might overwhelm them and they just shut down. It's like, oh, it's crazy. But if someone's still listening to us by, at this point, there's there's great hope.